All right. Uh, welcome to episode two of our humble podcast. Humble because we launched with little regard to audio quality and organization because yeah, not not humble because we are. We're obviously extraordinarily arrogant for yeah. believing that I mean, we belong here. Exactly, exactly. And we're busy leading our chaotic lives. So now like if we're gonna podcast, it's just gonna have to we just have to go for it. So that's what's happening. That's correct. And um we are feral polymath. My name is Gail Tao. Maria Quintana. And the goal of this podcast is to, we're sort of just, this is our space to explore ideas, engage in debate, investigate, learn, looking inside and outside ourselves, trying to figure out everything there is to know in the universe and have a complete understanding of humanity and our place in time and space. And that's, right. just, that, that's it, you know. You know, just in grand theory. unified theory. That's all. Just a little bit of that, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, we recently released episode one, which was a rambling, uh, just catch flies over there, Mary Leah. So Sorry, yeah. The I, audio, Mary Leah is busy catching flies midair. Sorry. He is like, you need chopsticks? Have you yes, seen I've the Karate go, Kid? You need Mr. Miyagi yes. on it. Exactly, exactly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so episode one sort of gave the intro to who we are and what we're doing and why. It was a little rambling, probably terrible quality as well. But you know that'll be a reoccurring theme until we decide oh, there's enough people that care enough. <laughs> like us, um, like we, or that we care enough, or that we care enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, I mean, when you have too many things going on in life, you can't wait for everything to be just right to do what you feel like doing. You just have to jump in, and that's what we have done. We have jumped in. That's advice for seems all concerned. people. No, I'm just thinking, like, well, I'm hoping that everybody jumps in. I think it's good to jump in. I agree. Yes. I agree. And hence, you're here. So we're going to start this episode with, we're going to start with um, things we learned this week and things that annoyed oh. us this week. And then we'll oh, launch excellent. into our topic. Um, I'm going to let Mary Leah go first. What is something you learned you this week? Spot? I am. Yes. Congratulations. All right. Okay. So actually, the thing that I learned is also the thing that annoyed me this week. So they Ooh, like two for one. together when you when you propose this. But what I learned about this week is corn, which is a fascinating topic. And uh, so, you know, it's spring, it's time to plant things. And, you know, you hear the whole three sisters idea, right? And, um, uh, you know, the corn and your legumes, your beans and your squash are your three sisters. That's where you get like three sisters casserole i don't know do you make this at home nope i'm you don't eat i'm meat. a white picky eater mary leah what are you talking about <laughs> never witnessed this abomination food. it's my food is like you know corn beans and and squash it's a classic okay <laughs> but anyway i'm just Probably saying that good and healthy it's but, delicious you know. super healthy but what i'm what what the, the cool thing is like so you hear like oh that's a native american thing right but i've been reading this amazing book called braiding sweetgrass and i should know the author for that can we can we just drop that in can we edit are you ever going to listen to Do this you want to so edit? edit it which one oh, of us is, you can google while we're while we're going all right that's, you google you awesome. google braiding sweetgrass <laughs> breathing <laughs> sweetgrass braiding braiding braiding, braiding. grass is very is extremely sweet braiding and extremely disturbing and wonderful book it's a it's a really it's a one-two punch of a book robin um, wall Kimmerer. exactly Sweet grass. God, I can't even talk about Sweet grass. So, Braiding so sweet grass, indigenous woman's scientific knowledge and the teachings of plants by Robin Wall there you go. Kimmerer. There now, we go. so the thing is that she's a biologist, which of course is close to our hearts, right? Mm -hmm. 
And the other thing that's cool about her is that she's blending all these different um, sources of knowledge in in a in a both a, an open and a rigorous way. But so this is what I learned, which was awesome. So I've I've heard this about these three plants that they benefit each other. That the beans grow up the grass. I mean, um, grow up the 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 um, corn so that they get exposure to light. Legumes uh, corn depletes the soil of nitrogen because it's very hungry and um, legumes actually uh, foster bacteria in the soil that promotes nitrogen uh, uh, that, that that they create nitrogen in the soil they replace the nitrogen that the corn pulls out and the pumpkins what are those things squashes they provide ground cover and protect the plants from insects you know, the base of the plant from getting, you know, invaded by insects, which, you know, precludes the use of pesticide. And so what I learned about this is that, you know, this is an extremely efficient way of growing. And if you think about it, all three of these plants are fully domesticated. Like they were created as they exist today through the interaction of humans with these plants, right? Like they mm -hmm. were not only cultivated, they are domestic plants. And the thing that I find shocking is that when Europeans came to the, to the Americas, they saw this going down. And apparently they were like, this is ridiculous. This is totally disorganized. Are, Why are you growing these plants all together? This is nuts. You guys are lazy, boring people. <laughs> like, we got to we separate were taught them out. Through years of serfdom that you make nice, neat rows that kings like to look at. <laughs> and you <laughs> give them your portion. And you cut down the whole damn thing. None of this, like, oh, we love the earth. Only harvest half of all your produce. No, no, no. This is not what we do. If you don't take all of the harvest, then you are just really lazy. We do not acknowledge that you are just allowing the plants to reseed themselves so you don't have to actually plant the plants later and contain the grain in some weird container. So anyway, I realized that monoculture, as I was driving through the beautiful fields of Pennsylvania, is like incredibly stupid. <laughs> That it's just the least efficient way to grow this particular domesticated plant, which was by humans created to be grown in conjunction with these other plants, which also create the nutrients necessary to digest the corn. And if you don't eat the corn with those, you know, with, um, you know, other vitamins, you go totally insane and become murderous. And that's what happened to America. And that's what happened to America. So that's what I learned this week. And it annoyed me. It totally annoyed me. And the other thing that I learned about corn, and this only made me happy, is do you know what corn silk, the, an anatomically what corn silk is? I don't want, do I want to know? <laughs> it's the vagina. <laughs> it's the vagina. I thought it could be something. It was basically, I was thinking uterine wall. Well, yeah, basically that too. I mean, okay, yeah. I mean, it's kind so, of yeah, all. It's... <laughs> the, the, you know, the little ball, the, the corn ear, each, each and every silk hits one base of a corn ear, the base mm -hmm. of the corn ear. So it gets, so they explode their pollen, then it has to let out its little silks. And then the silks get the pollen. And then and I love your reenactment. Ooh. Yeah, this is what happened. Then it's like, oh, yeah. fucking the corn. My, uh... <laughs> yeah. And okay. then and then the little corn kernel is the little tiny, you know, fertilized corn egg. Corn. <laughs> That's what each and every one You're of them is. You think of my my um, middle schooler came home traumatized recently from sex ed class where well, actually no. She was spared trauma because <laughs> the teacher told them what the curriculum said they had to do and that they didn't have to do it. And that was reenact just like you did. Oh, the sperm and the egg. Oh, no. I was like, God, I believe your teacher just, I'm just hoping this. Like, what? 
<laughs> like it's every everyone's middle school nightmare. All the little <laughs> middle, of course, like they're all doing it in the hall all day long. <laughs> like, ah! Yes. Poor middle schoolers. They really Man. screw this up, you know? <laughs> you know, really I think it's just everyone has to go through the trauma of, yeah. I mean, you know, when you're female, your body just kind of, whether you it's, want it or not, you get that. <laughs> you're it's like, a doozy. Why? Oh, it is a doozy. Terrible situation. Terrible situation. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, so that's oh. what I learned. That's so you learned. Now, it could be that uh, monoculture is more efficient at large scale. Do you look into this at all? So I that know, I have it. Well, that. All, all I know is that when they have a giant monoculture, you have to go back in and spread it with pesticides. And you have to do a lot of different stuff. And you have to replace the nitrogen. Taken care of naturally. Now, now, um, at a large scale, are you able to like, maybe it's hard. It's what it was probably more efficient at is harvesting. If you're going to harvest the entire mm -hmm. crop, you don't use the labor of the entire community to harvest it. You use a, a mechanical harvester, right? And yeah, definitely and that's hard to do. Yeah, that would but be impossible. surely with modern technology, we could. Do yeah, it. I mean, it would take the invention of like a new machine or something. To, so yeah, absolutely. There are reasons why, and and they do have a beauty of their own. I mean, they've the, something replaced what was there before, and that's you know cornfields. But it also like kind of hits me in the gut in a different way. Kind of having a sense of how how dumb it is. <laughs> I once, uh, and you know this, got to ride a greyhound bus all the way across the country. Yes, and did. Uh, discovered just how much of it is cornfield. That nuts. whole middle section, just cornfields. And it's not even like the rolling cornfields; it's like flat, flat. cornfields. In Pennsylvania, we've got like going. small farms rolling. It's very pastoral. It's lovely. <laughs> yeah, fun times, fun times. Yeah, so we should we your... should tell that story one day. I I do yes. think that's an important story to tell. Of your, yes, your college why origin story. Was that? <laughs> yeah, one day, one day. Okay. All righty. So that was your thing you learned and the thing that made you angry. Yes. Um, I learned, so we had talked, not on this podcast, but about the Disappearing Spoon book. Yes, I love that How book. cool it is because, like, I listened to it uh, as an audio book with my daughter on a road trip and right after she learned about the periodic table at school. So she was super into it. So it goes to the whole history of the periodic table and, but not just like, mm -hmm. <laughs> that sounds really boring. No, no the it's story awesome. of all the people behind it and all the drama, all the conflict and all of that. And I discovered this, this guy has written other books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now I'm listening because I always, <laughs> I read by listening to audio books. It's efficient, so do I. you can do, Household chores and other tasks. You could be driving. It's it's how I get my reading done. But just, uh, just so you know, I <laughs> contemplated asking you if we could podcast while folding laundry, but I thought it would be too much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could be cleaning off the desk that's in front of me right now. We won't talk about. You mean like what all is going like this? Oh, I got. Like, we got some candy okay. wrappers. I've got, got half projects. Up. Yeah, I've got like I got a oh, I've got a pile my, of pictures. You know what this is? Books. <laughs> and you know, there's <laughs> lotion yeah, there's samples. Uh, oh Jesus. Oh, oh, I got I've got earbuds. something cool. We got stuff. I've got yeah, I've got pile I've got artwork. <laughs> Show here. and tell. You wanna, I wanna see my my um I, I this is a plug for Garfield from memory I was telling you about that she gave me some Garfield nachos. Whoa. Um, Garfield amazing. nachos. Very exciting. <laughs> I have anything hey, that is art. I do have a shoe because our puppy keeps keeps eating shoes, so they end up like on things so that she doesn't get them. But you know, that's yeah, that's about shoes. the most exciting thing on my desk. Oh. Anyway, shoes. the disappearing spoon guy wrote other books. I think so that's I've awesome. And so I've been listening to the violin. It's some and other lost tales of love, war, and genius. I'm as written them. by our genetic code. And the author is Sam Keen, that's P-E-A-N. And so I've been listening to that book. 
And I just finished a section where he talks about how patterns in DNA mimic other patterns in nature, which is always interesting because, you know, I mean, you know, everyone knows about the like, yeah, Archimedes spiral, mm -hmm. Fibonacci numbers and all of that. But he was everyone, also talking obviously. about um, well, <laughs> all of you do, right? <laughs> Get with the program if you don't. Oh, come on. At least Google it, all right? Well, I always it's really find cool. it interesting because this is going to sort of segue into somewhat our topic today, um, which is sort of the, the, the mathematical and the creative, right? Because you often mm -hmm. think of things like randomness or like uh, uh, language is more of a creative, fuzzier type thing than math is, right? Mm -hmm. And but um, he was talking about, you know, the DNA and all these different ways things can combine. And he was talking mm -hmm. about a ling uh, linguist, was he a linguist, this guy named Zips. That's his last name. Zips. Z-I-P-F. I don't know. I didn't look any further. <laughs> um, created this law called Zips Law, which Zips. basically he, he spent a lot of time like looking at books and dictionaries and things and counting different words. But he discovered ah, yeah. that uh, this thing called Zips Law, which is like in any large text, if you count up the most common word, the second most common word, the third most common word, the first most common word appears twice as often as the second most common word, three mm -hmm. times as often as the third most common word, and things like that. And so it's, it's actually like, a, you know, it ends up being a statistical law. You can sort of look all so, this wait, stuff so up. So does that? Um, so how is that growing? Like if you go with the least to the most? Yeah, I don't know if it holds to all the way to the end of the text. And it, <laughs> it's of like, course, it's um, let's see one word. You know, I mean, well, you have like a scatter plot. Words on a page are a little ones. random, right? Like there's a certain randomness. So it's like when you flip a coin a hundred times, about yeah. half the time it's heads, right? It's right. almost never yeah. exactly that. So it's that kind of law, right? Okay. But um. Oh, here's an actual statement of the law. In every language, in every language, the most frequent word occurs twice as often as the second most frequent word. Now, this phenomenon called Zipp's Law is more than a century old, but until now, scientists have not been able to elucidate it exactly. So there's a study I found. Maybe we should link this in the show notes. We'll make show oh, nice. notes. It'll be a Good thing. Show notes. Um, so oh, anyway, nice. I'm digging around with that because I find it just... Uh, it's, a, it's interesting also, in light of a lot of thoughts I've had recently about language and uh, in terms of, you know, these AI language models that are interpreting mm -hmm. what you're saying and how in order to give it a prompt, you have to make sure you're a lot of people don't speak very clearly. And it's like your writing has to be you have to it like like how I'm being clear right now. You're being very clear. Um, yeah, so you have to be sort of, you have to make sure everything's clear and specific, right? And it's like with your programming, yeah. you, you, you have, have to be have really like clear and specific. Some kind of criterion that. But we a still phrase. do a lot of communication that's kind of fuzzy and ambiguous, and we just sort of talk that people talk all the time without really yes. comprehending what the other person is saying, but they have some idea that they they think it is. Anyway, yeah, that's they the whole use thing. context and a whole bunch of other things. Yeah, to on what so you're I saying. just find it interesting that there's like mathematical laws that sort of line up with language phenomenon. And yeah, that's as well, far as I also, got. It's also well, it's also a weird. <laughs> it's a weird idea in general to like try to visualize what that would mean because it's almost like a blanket of a single word that ties everything together and mm -hmm. that. Communi the communication itself would be blanketed with a, some sort of word. I don't even know what word the most common word. I wonder what the commonalities between co the com most common word of different languages would be, or are they completely dissimilar to each other? Are they all connectors? Are they all? Yeah. The, or so, so yeah, I think uh, the most common does end up being something like that. But it's um, sorry, mm -hmm. my puppy is now trying to eat me because uh, that's what she does. Um, what was I thinking? I had a thought. It's gone. Um, well, you're explaining how that might common be. words, different languages. Oh, it's because language is meant to be as efficient as possible as, or something was a mm -hmm. hypothesis somewhere as to why it works out that way. Mm -hmm. So you want to use as few words as possible. And so you build off that right. first word and so well, on and so forth. In, in a way, what you're one of the things you're referring to is like like one of the things that was so profound about 
um, Noam Chomsky's contribution to linguistics was those tree diagrams that allow you to take, oh, we're gone. I'm still um, here. Language to language to see that grammatical structure um, has to kind of function in a regular way, you know, that uh -huh. as you go through the different languages, you're able to create these trees that will maintain a structure, um, you know, that's different across languages, but it's it's always that way for that language. And um, that was really profound and, and had a mathematical, it, 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 that wasn't a statistical um, idea, but it uh, it's just a structural idea that's, that changes the way that you think about how how language works. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Language is often a thing people think of as, you know, it's like this weird fluffy thing without rules mm -hmm. to it. You just say things, right? But it's not. There's and even when you're not trying to obey the language rules, they're gonna be in there anyway. Right. But yeah, yeah I, I was I, reading this this there's book lots and of I, phonemes too, where like yeah. phonemes have to like follow each other in certain ways. Yeah, because your mouth can only do so many things. Wow. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so they were talking about that in this book because they were talking about it also as being paralleled and basically how um, uh, whatever things combine in DNA. I'm just not going to have words. Just That's okay. Stuff, I like that. Combined. I can yeah. totally see yeah. it. Like so DNA there's like, you know, like plus language. DNA. Like in language, and then they and like, like the math, together. and it's like all the same. It makes sense. <laughs> so that's my exciting <laughs> thing I learned. It's very exciting. I love it. And my my weekly thing that I hate was not anything like oh the cornfields have <laughs> monocultures. Oh, yeah, so you know, my you know, I like totally people. I hate as them a, as a total hippie. <laughs> Dipshit. What are you? <laughs> well, go ahead. No, tell yeah. me. Tell me. No, mine is. Let's see. I, I hate when. Actually, no. I'm gonna have a new one because I went to I went to Costco today on a <gasps> Sunday afternoon. Yeah, everyone should hate that. <gasps> okay. So when I when I go to a crowded place, I try to be aware of my surroundings. I try to be off to one side. I try to not stop in yes. the middle of a place. If I'm going to examine the cheese, I pull over, you know? Yeah, you don't like, want to have like, this cart behind you. But why do so many people enter a grocery store and they're just like amazed and sort of zigzagging <laughs> slowly down the middle? And then they see something, they got to put the cart like slanted to completely block it. <laughs> and then they got to like walk around. like. I don't know if it's just like, do people, do people just completely lack awareness or is it that like there's just so many people that the few that do are so noticeable and they cause the backups? Do I ever mm. block anybody or am I always perfect? I'm I sure think perfect. I'm always perfect because I'm always not wanting to be bad so that I can judge others. That's right, you, you want to be perfect. To, you have to hold yourself to a very high standard and become start judging others. That's right. So, <laughs> you've got a free pass to judge others. Like, when you're no really one well. knows how to like get their car out of the parking lot without taking 20 minutes to pull out of their spot and then block three people, you know? Like, oh my gosh, it drives me nuts because I'm always like, anything I do, I start trying to optimize for efficiency and grocery stores are mm -hmm. one of those. Like, I've got my route, I pull over here, I don't get in people's way, I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to grab this stuff. And then like, mm -hmm. I go and it's like, people are just standing there. Standing Staring, there. Staring, circling, and you're like, like why? looking around. You can just move like three inches, I can... <laughs> squeeze through, but now we're all waiting for you to decide which Easy Mac is better. <laughs> and I have things to do. Anyway, <laughs> people are bound to be. They are in my way. Uh, they're, 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 and Alfredo and I drive around and we see this, we're like domingueros. It's like uh, Sunday drivers uh -huh, is the way that would tra translate. It's just like yeah. people there's like a thing about Sundays where people just lose their minds. Just oblivious. <laughs> <I can't. laughs> 
it's it's also a big contrast that I see between like driving around in New York City and driving in Delaware. Is is like this? It's exactly what you describe in Costco, except like on the entire driving experience. <laughs> because, oh my yeah, gosh! I it, should it, mention it, the few times it, I've been talking to Mary Leah on the phone when she's been driving in New York. She's usually being cussed at by people. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I'm probably the one who's in people's way there. <laughs> But I am getting with the program, okay? I am totally getting with the program. And now I cuss other people out. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so you're just dishing it out now. That's well, yeah. Well, because, like, there's this whole, like, law of efficiency in New York. It's like, we, they, everybody will tolerate all kinds of insane shit as long as you are utilizing the space and letting people move. If you are not, you're going to get honked at and cursed at to the end of your day for not moving your ass. Maybe I'm supposed to be in New York. <laughs> you would love I've New York. I've always been scared of such a large city. But oh, I like, grew up in a it. town of like 500 people. So it's like, ah! <laughs> no, no. I think like judging people, <laughs> hating people, and wanting everything to be efficient, <laughs> you, okay, would be, okay. you would be in heaven. Yeah, maybe. I Man, should try that out sometime. <laughs> oh man, and you'd have such a wide population to hate. <laughs> but yeah, and then you're in Delaware, and everyone's like kind of nice, except that it drives you insane if you want them to be efficient because they're like, "Oh, we're just gonna wait for this guy to turn it to like move for the light," because you know we don't have anywhere to go. Where's this rush? <laughs> yeah, 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 bastards. Yeah. You might not have anywhere to go, but I do. Yes. I've uh, I've been very happy that my car has that uh, adaptive cruise control because mm -hmm. it means I don't tailgate people as much anymore. Because I just That's kept my helpful. adaptive cruise control and maintain a safe distance, and I don't have to think about it so much. <laughs> if you listen to my audiobook, and nice. you can anger just relax. Goes down. This is, and Pod brings your blood pressure down too. Exactly. It's, it's good for everyone. Well, we we do have this joke also about people that tailgate <laughs> or like speed around, like ass to the left. We're always like, okay, you know what happened to them? They have a turtle. They have a turtle in their butt and they've got to take it home for an emergency. The turtle. The turtle is trying no, to they're... emerge. <laughs> And you know, That's it could be, happening. it could be. It could totally be, you don't know. It definitely <laughs> makes, this is our version. This is how we build empathy, Gail. This okay, you empathy. just have to put a story in your mind that <laughs> the crazy thing someone else is doing is something you would totally be doing if... If, if you had a turtle. You had a turtle. <laughs> All right, good to know. <laughs> Oh, man. I'm just going to be imagining horrible ailments and things to everyone I meet that I don't like. That one's probably suffering from, I don't know, general incompetence. Oh, no. Yeah, no, that one's in labor for sure. <laughs> this person just doesn't know any better. They were never taught. It's not their fault. That's right. Well, I yeah, feel like I had a therapist tell that. me to approach things like that once. And really? remember being like, well, no, you didn't say it in those words. You're like, well, oh, I, I this. had this is, it hard. This is the one I like. This is the good one <laughs> okay. who I don't know where he even is anymore. But um, no, <laughs> I just remember being like, you know, it kind of makes sense. But mostly I want to hate people. So I have to have my bad story about how they're being bad to me. Right. And that makes And me then feel I can better. feel justified in my anger and superior. And then I'm good. So, well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the point. Well, you know, I think what 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 the teeth what what brings the teeth out of that is like one of the things that I've been learning about anger is that it is um, usually well I don't know this is a generalization probably but a large part of anger is a protest against injustice or what is perceived injustice right uh -huh. so if you feel if you have grown up being treated unjustly you will get a good like pot of anger <laughs> stored up in you so like all those injustices especially those you couldn't like react to or speak out against as a kid now you get to bless the whole world with them <laughs> shared a room with all my siblings for too many years there you go that's <laughs> it that's the source uh, of your 
pot of anger. That's it. That's it right there. I was telling my my son about this the other day. I'm like, you realize you have your own room. You guys all have your own room. You don't know how good you have it. You get whatever food you want. You're not eating no rice puffs. And you get you rice get a puff. did you have rice puff cereal for oh breakfast? God. Oh my god, and it would melt. I remember the rice puffs. Mm-hmm. They came in a bag and they would go stale like instantly. <laughs> yes. Oh god ah, damn. Good times, good times. But look hey. at us, we're still alive, it's fine. We lived. <laughs> well, what we're gonna talk about today. <laughs> oh, we have yeah. all the people we have a topic and it's just kind of and this is like I don't know, uh 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 blah 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 I can't speak. Okay. Today's topic, the topic of today's episode, the math language divide. That's what I have written. Oh, nice. Nice. Um, someone recently, like, and I, I know I've told this one to you a million times, the whole people would be terrified to admit they can't read, but people are not embarrassed to say they can't do math. And, In fact, uh, they say it loudly. They're like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. no, yeah. not like, me. No, it's terrible. Oh. What? <laughs> do that. And, and and then there's also this whole weird, like, you've heard the whole myth of the left brain versus the right brain. Like, there's some people who are left brain, and those are the ones that are good with logic and reasoning and math. I was trying to remember which one is which. And right brain ones, those are the creative and the blah, blah, blah. And, like, mm-hmm. you're either one or the other, and you can't be both. And I'm like... Mm-hmm. But why do we think that? Like, I've never, I always, like, have felt, and you as well, like, we're in these, like, two worlds. Like, yeah, I studied math and physics, but I also did a whole lot of creative writing and, like, not sci-fi, which is everyone's first guess. They're like, it must be sci-fi that you're, no, no, no. no. We also (laughs) do have, like, two hemispheres of brain. And they are, there's this surface <laughs> colossal that like integrates things across and like you, you can use, you use them both at once. <laughs> even if one is like, even if the theory is that one's dominant, it's not like you just like the The other one just, just is there all like, like what happened? Dying. Oh, I mean, the, yeah, that right. only, ha- you know, you could have like, that would always... if that were the case, then everyone would have like serious aphasia of some kind or another. Yeah, which you know, I mean, have you interacted with people lately? It it's could be. <laughs> but, that's true. But uh, but yeah, there's this whole like you're either science mathy or you're creative, and like, but <laughs> I mean, it hasn't always been like that. Like, look at the whole Renaissance, right? You have people like Leonardo da Vinci and and stuff uh, like that. Hmm. Like, there you go. why do we have this sort of common era myth that? never the two shall meet or somehow you are one you can't be the other and i've had students when i've been teaching you know like teaching like either astronomy 101 or something and they'll be like oh um i'm an english major so i'm not sure if i'm gonna do well and i'm just i'm like that doesn't mean that you shouldn't, can't learn. That shouldn't mean you can't do basic math or learn things well also <laughs> the point is that you are in fact if it's a basic level class, the point is to teach you this thing. It's not that you, like, I can see where maybe, okay, I don't have the background for this, but that's a completely different. Different than not having the capacity. Right? Exactly. So why, why is it like this? And I've had a few thoughts, like oh. one, one thought I had sort of goes down the whole, um, so <laughs> I gotta say this without sounding like an apple. Everyone can hate me. I'm the one you hate. Mary Lee is the one you love. That's how this Uh, works. Maybe. Um, So I think about it like the the divide between like the people that go into STEM and the people that go into creative fields. And I've told my oldest kid this before too. This this um, if you're going into engineering or medicine or math or physics, if you can't get the right answer when you do the problem it, like you like in order to succeed in those fields like you cannot fake it you, it's really hard to fake your way through that right you're not going to go get your master's in engineering if you just really never got calculus 
Yes. Um, there's no way to get through it without really being good at it. Okay. Well, uh, competent, I'd say maybe. Competent. Yeah. <laughs> there's some people that make it through certain <laughs> levels by like, I was really good at doing the algorithms. I was giving there you go. I didn't actually have thought, but I could do the algorithms. But but that's that's plug a whole chuggers. other thing. <laughs> the plug in chuggers, yes, aren't they lovely? Um, and but with creative things, because it's a subjective thing. Like if you're going to be an art major, mm -hmm. well, the art majors, the people who can make it all the way to the end and get the degree, you're going to end up with a spectrum. A much wider spectrum than you'd end up in the STEM fields, right? Uh, actually, because it would be. I would say that objective, right? I would say that it would be a distinct advantage to have a large capacity for bullshit. <laughs> I'd say, like being sincere and putting the work in might put you somewhere, maybe in the middle, if not the bottom, of the hierarchy <laughs> in the art world. If you actually work really hard at art, then they kind of he'll tolerate you. Yeah, as long as you can just be confident and tell them that what you did was super creative. And and Mary Leah knows this story. This goes back to my undergrad days, the quarters, the wobbly quarters, oh, Mary Leah. No, the wobbly quarters, holy shit. I, right, had this, hear it. I had this art class, drawing class in college, and we were told to draw six of something. Okay, I'm like, six of something is our homework. And I'm like, I wanna challenge myself. So I get six quarters and I place them at weird angles and I work really hard to like do all of that. And then we go and we all put our drawings up and someone has drawn six leaves. And by a leaf, I mean like the kind that you make with three lines, you know, you make the little oh. sort of almond shape and the line in the middle and they're just floating on the page. There you okay? go. Oh, God. The review of my quarters were that they were wobbly the review of the leaves were that they were dancing. dancing. <laughs> like, what is happening? <laughs> wow. But that was, no. I'm sure, very encouraging of your effort. <laughs> whatever, whatever. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is like, well, I think uh, oh, when you are in a field that is more subjective, it's a lot easier to get through by sort of faking your way. This is not to say all artists are shit. This is to say, yeah. when you go to see art, it'll be a mix of shit and good stuff. <laughs> well, because I mean, everyone gets through the filter. I mean, this is, there is a certain charm to like a Duchampian <laughs> bullshit as art experience. But yeah, but even that has like a quality, a quality gradient to it. Um, and the other thing, I, I mean, it's also, I mean, it's weird to see the amount of bias that there is in this um, and how little the worlds understand each other. I found it really, really bizarre that when I applied to art school from my math program that I defected from, <laughs> like, explosively um, or implosively, maybe. Um, that when I went to interview, there was like a big deal made of the idea that like, oh, um, you know, as creative people, there's a lot of drinking at board. <laughs> like, are you are you gonna be able like, to do that? Do you know mathematicians drink too? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah. I was like, you must exist on a totally different like plane of, of conservative boredom or something it's like no actually these half these kids are on speed guys like you don't know <laughs> jesus i i don't i i didn't start drinking i never drank before i got to math grad school <laughs> yeah so yeah. i mean that's a little off topic but yeah it's it's very weird how there's no understanding of these two worlds mm -hmm. and um and culturally they're seen as not being able to talk to each other at yeah. all, and which is so bizarre. Weird. I mean, there was a while when I was in Oregon where like I was still, you know, by day teaching physics and astronomy mm -hmm. and by night I was 
writing 10 minute plays and directing them as part of this theater group. And anytime I would tell one group of people about the other world, they were like, what? Like, <laughs> what do you mean? Like the, the theater people, like you teach physics? And then the <laughs> physics people are like, you write, it must be sci-fi. No, it's not sci-fi. I mean, to be fair, I have written some sci-fi. Right. But not most, mostly it's not. <laughs> well, I've had so many people ask me like whether my art is like mathy. <laughs> Like, like they just once expect. I made you make mathy art for my book. Well, yes. Well, that was cool though. That was not my, sci-fi. That was, deal. that was okay. That was total, which was totally not sci-fi <laughs> at all. That was relating math to emotions, and that I'm totally into. But like, there's this expectation that since you were in a math background, that like, oh, you've got to make like cool geometric things, and it's like, nope, it has my vagina. <laughs> Yeah, I've had that with my writing too. Not even just like, do you write sci sci fi, but like, do you use math in your writing? Do you use it it's to like, inform well, your thoughts? Yes. And it's like, well, I mean, but not I to do, like number my chapters. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, sometimes I'll weave nerd stuff in there because I just, you know, it's what I do. Yeah. But like, no, like, I actually, the, I feel like the things about math and science that I like enhance my writing while the things that i like about writing enhance my ability to engage in understanding math and science because mm -hmm. the math and science side of things is what teaches you how to be like precise mm -hmm. careful organized solving puzzles a lot of editing is puzzle solving like this chapter needs to do this without doing that and this person needs to show up and it needs to make sense it's a puzzle and you solve the puzzle, right? And so that's how I would approach that. Um, so oh, for those who are good. watching, Mary Leah has vanished there's from the screen me. and reappeared. Oh, no, so now there's two of her and the one image will disappear shortly. This oh. happened last time as well. But you know, I just keep I going. Was speaking <laughs> from I, the girls? I was Google. Or, huh? Yes, it says Marty's multi sisters. I'm not sure what that means. That means that the cat owns my children who have multiple modalities of being okay. in service of the cat. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Whose name is Marky? Okay, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what were we talking? We were talking about language no we're talking about oh god are perverts gonna now I'm like cool. look for my kids google <laughs> uh, i don't know how they would piece that together so i think we're good okay let's go <laughs> i feel like the whole yeah i don't know people you you hear about the things you don't hear about the things that don't happen which are much more common which is nothing nothing happens to most people well, I should tell you something did happen to one of my kids, and I'll, I'll tell well, you about Well, Mary that later. Leah, it always happens. Mary Leah is a magnet for the weird happens shit. To me. So that's how that works. Yeah, I'm like a repository for the things that don't happen <laughs> to other people that shouldn't happen in someone's life. It's like, oh yeah, that that happened to me. Yes. Oh yeah, and that one also, and then lightning yeah, three or four times. That one also. Yeah, yeah all those things. <laughs> anyway. Happen. Yeah, I don't think there's anything in that name that's going to. OK, we're good. <laughs> we're good. And uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, math informs writing. And then writing also informs math, because the, the creativity side of it, like, god, that's the one thing I love the most about writing is just um, I always like doing it as a just spill the brain out in a pile, and then you sort it out later be creative and i would solve math problems like that too i remember in grad mm -hmm. school i would just be like i need a really big sheet of paper or a whiteboard and i just have to like blah, 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 every direction and then like okay which one was the right one let's circle that and then uh mm -hmm. like there'd be like this meandery circle because it's like blah, it looks like someone just puked math all over the place in a big math puzzle and then then i would rewrite it coherently right. somewhere else but just giving yourself the space with no boundaries just you know yeah. i really like that side of creativity that just 
I'm not going to have rules and what falls out of my head. Shit's just going to fall out, well, and then we'll see what we turn it into later. Well, I think this is one of the things people don't understand about math is that to do real math, to do math that's contributing to the science or the 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 body of knowledge. There you go. Um, you the exact program is to take what's known and look at it completely differently. Like you start from what's there, but if you just keep chugging from the point where you started, you're not really going to get to anything new. I mean, mm-hmm. you can to some extent, but the real uh, the real work of of expanding the body of knowledge is either reinterpreting, bringing different fields together, um, find it, finding, you know, there's a lot of people working on that. So a lot of harder and more significant problems, the obvious answer is not going to be, it's not going to give you anything usually. Like that's, that's, that, you know, that row has been plowed and mm-hmm. it's really about yeah, breakthroughs require that creativity. Unconventional thinking. It's not mm-hmm. about conventional thinking at all, which is completely against the stereotype of what mathematicians do. Well, those are the plug and chuggers. So now well, I have a thought. Chuggers. Like, so you've got the language people and the math people, and they're like, I'm this or I'm that. Maybe those are really the ones that are just like the ones that are claiming to be math people that don't like language or art are the plug and mm-hmm. chuggers. So they just right. aren't even that great at anything. They're just good at following that. And, 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 and the maybe the language the people <laughs> on the language side are the ones that aren't actually that good at language. They just talk a lot or they scribble on paper a lot and make scribbly marks and are like, I'm an artist, you know? And well, so they're like, and so maybe the truly now, brilliant people now, are polymath. That's right. And also now what you've, what you've told me is we have chat GP for that. No, GP, what is it called? Chat <laughs> GPT. We have um, AI. Oh, yeah. So, so, so I the, have the, this... the plug in chuggers are out. <laughs> yeah, done with the plug in chuggers. We don't need them anymore. Well, one <laughs> thought I'd had is the whole, you know, back at the Renaissance, you had a lot of people, there was a lot of new tools or ways of thinking coming on board. Yeah. But the, the big thinkers were the ones that were thinking across domains, right? Yes, Art absolutely. and science all, like would go together. And, uh, and I feel like as things advanced, it became a lot more, they became a lot more, people became a lot more specialized, sort of out of necessity, yeah. right? Because back then, all the really, what seems like simple discoveries were super easy. Like, oh, what's gravity? Things fall, they accelerate, you know? And now we're dealing with like, uh where's the electron (laughs) it's a fuzzy thing that's described by probabilities and what's underlying that reality yeah so so the really how do we even see that how do we even find out i don't know (laughs) exactly to go further in the field right now you have to really narrowly specialize to really gain that full body of knowledge and gain the skill set and all of that to nudge it a little bit further and that often precludes people from exploring other things. Right. But now uh-huh. we live in an era with modern computing and computers have done a ton for us so far. But yes. with the new AI stuff coming out, like I play with, with uh, the language model stuff all the time. Chat GPT is my friend. <laughs> Um, but just like to move things around, brainstorm ideas, organize stuff, see things in a different way. But it it makes, once you start using like AI automation for things, we can do it for calculating. You can do it for, um, I make it write up HTML code for me, which is like, I've been avoiding learning anything like that because I'm like, I used to do like C plus stuff in undergrad. And I just remember mm-hmm. like, you have to be able to like let it swallow your whole brain. But when you live a chaotic life with like pets and children, it's just painful to be ripped out of your concentration repeatedly. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I just haven't bothered to do that. But now I can just go and say, write a script that does blah, 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 blah. And I know what the algorithm needs to be. I know what these precise instructions need to be. I just don't know what the format is. And it just doesn't. Yeah, and you don't now have to memorize that. I don't or have look to know it, any of that. Up piece by piece. And like, the, like, and it can HTML usually, guide. 
look at like I can usually figure out what it's doing for the most part. So if I need to make little tweaks, I yeah, can usually figure out where those need to go. It's not as hard to so, read. It's not as hard to read as the generate. Yeah. And then you also have and and this is a whole thing we should probably discuss is like, you know, AI can write, which is something I do. AI can make <laughs> art, which is something Mary Leah does. AI can do like all sorts of things now, right? And yeah. so what is that going to do for freeing up people uh, to think across domains more, making that more of a thing going forward, right? So mm -hmm. you don't have to be a great artist because the AI will do your illustrations for you as you whatever else you do. It, yeah, you it would definitely <laughs> wipe out a lot of illustration work for sure. Yeah, so there's a lot to think about. And like, I think the real way to think about it is not so much as, oh, we can't let it do this thing that people do. And needs to be more of a, what do people do now with this new tool? And it doesn't mean, oh, we don't need creative people anymore. We do, because we need any them even more. AI tool is literally just, I'm just reorganizing shit I was given. I'm not making anything new, new. It's just, different combinations of things that already existed. So we still need the, right. you know, feeding it things, coming up with new things, and then using it to build the next thing on top of that. Um, and this brings me back to the whole, you know, mathematical patterns in language. Are there mathematical mm -hmm. patterns in art? There certainly are in music. And mm -hmm. I've always thought about like, the real key difference between spoken language and math was just a matter of precision. Math is exact. It's a very sharp, precise, this means this thing. Language deals with fuzzy definitions. And in fact, I think like the bulk of any philosophical debate you ever hear between people is a result of them using different definitions for the same word. Yeah, there's a lot <laughs> of that. There's, there's a, a lot, lot of, of that. Not establishing their de definitions. Their definitions, and they're both yeah. really actually agree with each other, and they'll argue to the death because one of them is defining a word this way, and the other one's defining the word that way, and so they're arguing. Right. And yes, and so how can you make? And then language is what you're feeding into the AI now that takes you know natural language and then tries to understand it, and so you've got to. Be careful in your precision, I would assume, unless it gets really good at guessing what people's fuzziness means, which it essentially does. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I've heard a lot of people recently communicating in ways that were not terribly precise, clear, or effective. Mm -hmm. And, and you're like, uh, that's where you're and failing. I'm like, that's because because I was listening to that one AI podcast, and the people were like, "Well, maybe there's room for people to create a, a software offering, software as a service offering for." generating really good prompts. And my thought was like, <laughs> well, the prompt is what you give the model, but to give like the instructions and it interprets that. And the whole, reasoning. <laughs> exactly, right? So I was like, isn't this kind of circular reasoning? Because if something's going to make the prompt for you, you have to be able to tell it what the prompt is. But then it occurred to me, so a lot of people really struggle with clear speech and communication. And so maybe the, the what more is needed is, is something like a template and yeah. structured things people can put stuff into. And that's the whole thing. But but yeah, so there was that thought as well. But language is meant to communicate. Math mm -hmm. can also it can carry ideas and communication, right? It's, it's, it's like a language that's more precise. Yeah. Language is fuzzy. And people sometimes just live in the fuzziness without ever, they just kind of communicate back and forth in fuzzy blobs. Rude. Yeah, uh, we and just communicate psychically. Exactly, so that's way more efficient. But I've also like thought about like quantum experience, the efficiency of different like, like ways of communicating. Spoken language tends to be a lot easier than math because math is sort of like you know you have to get down to the nitty gritty, pinpoint everything down, and that takes time, right? Yeah. But uh, art is a form of communication. Also, you're conveying something but it starts to get really really subjective there where people have entirely different interpretations but are they supposed to or should art be done better better <laughs> like more visually more like know. like yeah really quick what is art communication to one thought is it has potential to hold a little more information the equation or a sentence or something like that, right? There's the mm -hmm. whole adage of picture is worth a thousand 
word for a reason. And I think there's a whole reason people have been, you know, we have emojis now. We text because you're losing some of your communication with the sentence. You need something that's an artistic representation of a frowny face. Yeah. something extra that you got in words, okay? Well, a lot of that is encoded in the experience of perception. I mean, the thing is, like, you're prompting. So, in a weird way, when you're writing, you're pushing experience through the filter of language. Whereas Mm -hmm. when you draw, you're actually giving that other person a direct visual experience, right? You're creating Mm -hmm. a visual experience that you just hand off to somebody. Now, there's a language inside of that, which is meant to be like a shorthand for depth perception or a shorthand for because you're doing it on a two-dimensional thing right you're not just Mm -hmm. like plopping them in an ai but that's coming also that's also on the horizon but but that of course will have its own conventions too because you know it's not the real world but um oh did we lose each other are we still together here i'm good yeah so so i mean I think that one of the things that's different about those two experiences is that that you're sort of engineering an experience. And so that's why abstract art kind of works, right? Or not work, uh, because you either are able to enter into that experience or not, right? That's always got me about art. It's like creating the art at a certain thought or feeling or experience we're trying to represent, but the audience doesn't get that. There's not failure of the art, failure of the audience, no failure at all, that's just what art is. What is that? Well, yeah, I think this is where the question of what's actually happening is so much more, is so relevant compared to like, oh, is it good or is it not good? Um, And yeah, I think you do have to like listen to other people to some extent <laughs> um, to know whether what you think is happening is happening um, because it really could not be. My cat is totally complaining, but maybe we should. Maybe this can be like our next topic. It seems like we're like getting into something new, new territory here. Yeah, yeah. So we can definitely get into the art as how you convey. We can also talk about that and. And we obviously solved all of the problems about like math versus math math. <laughs> Yeah, I mean solution there is what that like they're really polymaths the rule the world people polymaths rule the world. The other people are just hiding. They're just you know Maybe dragging us from, down. They're dead weight at they're this not point. A creative unless you can calculate, right? That's right. Get with the program. Get out your exactly. calculus book. Exactly. Dust it math, off and work on it. For it is just a language. And people get scared of it because it's got weird symbols in it. And all those are are somebody picked things to mean something because they didn't write it out every time. Math is also super dramatic. I, I I'll bring some nice like drama and math examples for next week. Math drama. Math yes. drama. Yes. Pain and yeah. agony, passion. It really, it really is. It's like learning a language. It's logical language. It's precise. It follows rules. It's so nice. It's not subjective. That's right. Why don't people get that? Not subjective. Hooray! <laughs> and art is not subjective either. It should be. It's a hundred percent. It's, it needs to be more efficient. I think it should be more efficient. Be more and if it's not, it's stupid. It's stupid. Exactly. Exactly. We talk about poetry. Okay, what's... <laughs> well, the thing, part of what it is, I think once you get into a creative field, you get a spectrum. You get people that are like, ooh, art means I scribbled for a while and threw it on the floor, crinkled it, and it who it is. And other people who like are actually like studying techniques because they want to represent certain things. They're using their emotions to choose the colors of the sheep. You know, and I feel like there's are you saying, say bucket together. 
Are you saying that the shit in the jar is not art? Because I, I would disagree with you there. <laughs> in a I don't know. I find it poetic, but we can debate that next week. All right. Come yeah, to shit in the jar. Over an hour now. I think I'm ready to wrap up the <laughs> But uh, to wrap up, I want to mention that we plan on doing this weekly. Um, you, we have a website, feralpumpmaths.com, and you can visit it. There's not much there right now, but there will be more there in the future. Um, and that's where at Feral Polymaths. We have a Facebook, a Facebook, we're going to call it. I believe, yeah, we're, we're working on it. Um, and those are places you can find us. Everything's kind of crazy and chaotic because, like I said, we've been wanting to do this for a while. We'll Nothing's be perfect. We're just doing it. Website. We're just doing it. And you can contact us also at contact Hi. at feralpolymath.com. You can also talk at the screen. You can talk at the screen. We won't hear you. We might put this on YouTube. You can put comments there, but we may or may not read those. But maybe we will if, unless, well, we will if you make us angry, and then we'll get angry, or I will, and then I won't get angry, but I will feel connected to you if you talk to the screen. Okay, good. You will feel that connection because you are an artist. Oh, sorry. All right. (sighs) Well, I'm going to end our recording here. So farewell, fine audience. Until next time. Bye.